In this lecture, we'll focus on employee separation and retention. First, we'll start with an overview of employee separation and retention and why we should care about separation and retention, and then we'll move on to voluntary turnover and involuntary turnover. So let's start with that overview. So what is separation in this context? Well, separation here refers to an employee who leaves an organization either voluntarily or involuntarily. And these are where the terms voluntary turnover or involuntary turnover come into play. So then what is retention in this context? Well, here retention refers to the process of keeping individuals within the organization who meet or exceed performance standards. So in other words, these are the people in the organization that are doing well, they're contributing to the organization, and who we wish to keep because failure to do so can result in cost. So what do I mean by cost here? Well, estimates suggest that the cost to replace an employee ranges from about 90% to 200% given the circumstance, and that's 90 to 200% of the annual wage or salary of that employee who decides to leave. So this can be quite costly for an organization. And these costs come from recruiting, selecting, onboarding, training, and managing the performance of those people who leave the organization. So as much as possible, especially when we're talking about people who are meeting or exceeding the performance standards for their job, we want to make sure that we put in efforts to keep those people within the organization. So now let's focus specifically on voluntary turnover. So what does voluntary turnover mean? Well, it refers to a departure initiated by the employee. In other words, this is a decision that the employee is making. The employee is deciding to leave the organization perhaps because they have access to better job alternatives or perhaps they're unhappy or dissatisfied with their current job or the organization as a whole. So when it comes to voluntary turnover, sometimes it's helpful to think about a, an established model. And in this case, this is a psychological model of voluntary turnover. And this is really a classic model that was nicely synthesized by Griffith, Holm, and Gartner in 2000. And the purpose of this model is to understand what are the precipitating factors or the antecedents, or in other words, the root causes of a person's decision to engage in voluntary turnover, which simply means they've decided to quit or leave the organization. Well, this model suggests that one of those antecedents or root causes can be described broadly as a person's desire to leave the organization. And within this idea, we can think of a person have, who has low job satisfaction, low organizational commitment, and low quality manager relations, as well as higher levels of stress, as perhaps having a higher desire to leave the organization, to get out of those uncomfortable attitudes, and to get into a situation that might be better at another organization. And so this model would suggest that people who have lower levels of job satisfaction, lower organizational commitment, lower quality relationships with their manager or their supervisor and higher levels of stress, among other factors, will be more likely to have what we call turnover intentions. And turnover intentions simply refers to a person's thoughts or cognition related to withdrawing from the organization or leaving the organization. So a person thinking about better job alternatives, thinking about uh, what it might look like and if they do leave the organization and perhaps when they're going to leave the organization as well. Now, ultimately, research suggests that people with higher levels of turnover intentions tend to be more likely to physically withdraw from the organization, which is another way of saying voluntarily turn over from the organization or to quit, simply put. Now, in addition to factors and variables related to a person's desire to leave, we can also think of another set of precipitating factors or antecedents or root causes that can affect turnover intentions and ultimately voluntary turnover, and those relate to ease of movement. And this means ease of movement outside of the organization, or rather to outside of the organization to another organization. And so this can include um, looking at things related to different people's job search behaviors and methods. So people who are more active on LinkedIn and other types of recruitment websites might be thinking more often of how they might move to an organization or identifying potentially better alternatives or better organizations or better jobs as compared to their own. And this gets to the next point, which is really a person's idea and their thoughts that they put into comparing their current job to other job alternatives. And these could be jobs for which they've already received some type of job offer, or it could be jobs that they've just seen postings or descriptions for on a recruitment website, on a social media website, or something of that nature. But the idea is the same here, that when people start to have greater sense of an ease of movement and greater ability to leave the organization for 
greener pastures or a better situation elsewhere. This will then lead to greater turnover intentions, which again are those thoughts or cognition related to quitting or leaving the organization. And ultimately over time, again, turnover intention, when you have higher levels of it, will lead, make it more likely that someone's actually going to quit or voluntary turn, voluntarily turn over from the organization. Now, it should be noted that this model implies somewhat of a progression of withdrawal over time. That first you have these building desires to leave, this perception of greater ease of movement that leads to more turnover intentions and ultimately to voluntary turnover. However, in some cases, people leave all of a sudden. And this is can be this can happen due to what sometimes are called shocks to the system. And this is consistent with the unfolding model of voluntary turnover, which was nicely synthesized by Mitchell and Lee in 2001. And the idea is that sometimes people might have, for example, an angry outburst at work or a big conflict that erupts with a coworker that makes them put in their notice immediately that they're leaving the organization and they didn't have a lot of forethought. And it would maybe be difficult for the organization to have foreseen this event happening. So sometimes there will be shocks or events that really propel someone very quickly into making that decision and to actually engaging in the action and behavior of leaving the organization or simply voluntary turnover. So it's often helpful if we're thinking about this from a manager's perspective to think about what are the warning signs of voluntary turnover. Well, as I just mentioned, some employees might depart or leave the organization due to shocks to the system, which would be consistent with that unfolding model of voluntary turnover. And if this is the case, you may have relatively few, if any, warning signs that someone is about to leave. And those are going to be ones that we just can't simply anticipate with any degree of certainty. However, there are going to be other situations in which that adhere more to that classic model of voluntarily, voluntary turnover I showed you earlier, where we will see some early warning signs that we can act on as managers, especially if these are employees who are meeting performance standards, and especially if they're exceeding performance standards, we want to put in efforts to try to retain them within the organization. What can we do, in other words, to address their dissatisfaction with their job, their lack of commitment to the job, or higher levels of stress, perhaps? So. Another thing to think about, too, is that sometimes there's going to be behavioral warning signs as well that we can maybe see in these employees who are thinking about leaving the organization. And so they may actually demonstrate what we call a progression of withdrawal. And here we'll focus on a progression of behavioral withdrawal, things that we can actually see an employee doing. And these are things that people might engage in prior to leaving the organization. So, for example, people don't they, if we think about this progression of withdrawal, they're not necessarily going to jump straight to voluntary turnover. Sometimes their behaviors will start manifesting in the form of tardiness. They'll come in late to work with greater frequency. And over time, high, higher levels or more frequent tardiness might lead to higher absenteeism, meaning that they might have more actual full days of absence from work. They might be calling in sick more and things like that. And then ultimately, those might build over time and they might decide to leave the organization voluntarily. Now, we can also think about this too from a cognitive perspective. So these are very behavioral, tardiness, absenteeism, and then actual voluntary turnover behavior. But we can also think about cognition too and cognitive withdrawal. And this is sometimes where surveys can be really helpful, is surveying employees about their levels of job satisfaction, organizational commitment, or even directly about their turnover intentions. Simply having employees respond to a statement like, in the next six months, I plan on quitting the organization and then giving them a strongly disagree to strongly agree response format can be a good way to try to anticipate whether or not you have a large number of employees that might be thinking about leaving. And so these are all things that we want to keep an eye on as they can be warning signs and they can greatly help us in our retention efforts. So now let's shift gears and talk about involuntary turnover. So what is involuntary turnover? Well, if you remember, voluntary turnover was turnover that's initiated by the employee themselves. Involuntary turnover, on the other hand, is a discharge that's initiated by the organization, often when the employee would prefer that the organization not initiate it. And what that means, in other words, is that the organization has made a decision to ask someone to leave the organization. And this could perhaps take the form of a dismissal, 
which means that perhaps the employee failed to meet performance standards consistently over time, and thus they're being dismissed from the organization, or in other words, fired or terminated. Or perhaps it could be that the involuntary turnover is because there have been changes in economic conditions. There's a downturn economically and the organization needs to um, eliminate positions. Or perhaps there's a change in strategy or a merger or acquisition that might result in a layoff, which would mean a group of employees being asked to leave, not necessarily because of their performance, but because the organization can no longer or no longer needs those employees, at least in that number. And so we're gonna focus the rest of the lecture mostly on dismissals. So cases where because an employee failed to meet performance standards, they're being asked to leave the organization. Now, layoffs are also important to consider, but we will focus almost exclusively on dismissals going forward in this lecture. So it's also important to remember that even in the context of involuntary turnover, replacing an employee can be costly because after all, even if we're going to fire someone or dismiss them from the organization, we still need to go and recruit, select, train, onboard, and so forth, manage the performance, get people up to speed to backfill or to fill that position that went empty because of the person that we asked to leave, left that position. Now, with that said, retaining an employee with problematic behaviors such as counterproductive behaviors, maybe theft or uh, harassment type behaviors could actually be considered negligent from the perspective of the, of the organization itself, the organization could be found to be guilty of negligence, in other words. And so we wanna make sure that we also do our due diligence and think really critically if someone does need to be asked to leave the organization or in other words, dismissed from the organization. Um, we also should consider other costs associated with retaining an employee with problematic behavior because this could actually be detrimental to other employees they're working with on their, in their unit, on their work team, and so forth. And so that's also something we can, we can consider as well. And it could be detrimentally directly on the performance of other people because other people are having to carry that person's more of the work that they were supposed to be doing and therefore they have less time to get to the work that they're supposed to be doing for their own jobs. Or it could be more related to morale effects or rather low morale that is leading to uh, worse performance because people are working with someone who's not pulling their own weight or someone who perhaps is unpleasant to work with or difficult to work with. Now we're going to shift gears a bit and we're going to talk about the employment at will doctrine. And the reason we're bringing this up is whenever you're thinking about dismissing an employee or in other words, terminating or firing an employee, it's important to be aware of your state laws if you're in the United States in terms of employment at will. And so here's a bit of context. Historically, without a specified contract, either the employer or the employee could sever the employment uh, relationship at any time. Now, employment at will says that employers have the right to terminate an employee at any time, and an employee has the right to quit at any time for any reason. Now, the power and influence of this employment at will doctrine within the United States has really eroded over recent decades, as employees today or former employees can sue their employer for wrongful dismissal, where wrongful dismissal refers to a discharge that is considered to violate the law in some way. So it'll vary by state within the United States, but there are some exceptions to the employment at will doctrine. And these indicate that an employer cannot dismiss an employee for the following reasons. And not every state is going to adhere to all three of the following um, exceptions. However, these are three possible exceptions that a state might allow for. So the first is called the public policy exception to the employment at will doctrine. And this, the idea here is that an employer cannot dismiss an employee if, when an employee was asked to do something illegal, unethical, or unsafe, but refused to do so. The next exception is called implied contract. And the idea here is that an employer cannot dis dismiss an employee for or when there is an implied contract, either written or oral, between an employer and an employee even though no explicit contrast in contract exists, okay? The third exception is called the covenant of good faith exception. And this exception is as follows, that an employer cannot dismiss an employee when an employer acted without good faith and fair dealing when dismissing that employee. 
So again, these will vary by state in the United States in terms of which of these that the state accepts as a proper exception to the employment at will doctrine. And it's good to be knowledgeable about what is um, accepted or what exceptions are, are addressed and recognized in the state in which you're working. Now, it's important to note, too, that if an individual was wrongly discharged due to their protected class, such as their race or their religion, a wrongful dismissal suit can actually be filed as a civil rights infringement. So what are some additional employee dismissal considerations? Well, first, we should ask ourselves the following questions. When we're going to terminate or fire someone or dismiss them from the organization, we want to ask ourselves first, were the root causes of the employee's performance problems investigated? In other words, did the employee get all the training they needed? Did they get all the developmental opportunities? Was there, did their supervisor help manage their performance effectively? We want to make sure that those things are, were investigated first. In some cases, you might simply find that the person, it was simply a selection or hiring error. That the person really, um, it looked like based on the selection tools and procedures they went through that they had a high potential for being um, a good performer on the job, but it turns out they really weren't a good fit in terms of their knowledge, skills, abilities, and other characteristics as it relates to the job requirements. The second thing we want to ask ourselves is, was the employee given feedback and opportunities to improve? This is a really important one to make sure that you've considered because we want to make sure that the issue isn't a lack of feedback or that they weren't given an opportunity to improve after get, receiving that feedback. So we wanna make sure that we address that too and before we go about actually dismissing someone from the organization. The third question we should ask is, were organizational policies and procedures followed when dismissing that employee? And so what this really refers to is a progressive disciplinary action process where it might look generically something like this. First, did the person receive a verbal warning? Next, did they receive a written warning over time because of continued, continued performance problems? Due to continued and ongoing performance problems, did they ultimately get a suspension, which then led to the termination after returning from the suspension and still engaging in the problematic behaviors or engaging in low performance? So this is what we call a progressive disciplinary plan or action plan. And it's generally advisable that an organization doesn't just simply, for those people who are performing at a lower level, they don't jump straight to termination or dismissal. Instead, there should be some kind of progressive disciplinary plan in place where, again, first perhaps there's a verbal warning, then there's a written warning, and then a suspension or whatever the organization deems appropriate. And this should be very clearly laid out in the organization's policies or handbook um, or all of the above, really. Now, of course, there's going to be some situations where an employee's behavior is so egregious, it's so counterproductive, unethical, or even illegal, that it, the organization will jump straight towards termination without much of a warning. Now, the last question we should ask ourselves when it comes to dismissing an employee is, was the timing of the decision considered? So thinking really thoughtfully and critically about when would be an appropriate time to inform the employee of this decision and thinking about both the time of the day, the time of the week, are there other employees around? Um, is it close to the holidays or a major holiday? All things that will be very contextual in nature. So this really comes down to also whomever, which is presumably probably the supervisor, at least the direct supervisor or a manager, should hopefully know the employee well enough to try to identify what is going to be a good time. There's never a perfect time. What is going to be a better time, rather, to inform the employee of the decision to have them dismissed from the organization? Now, it's also, also quite useful to apply and consider organizational justice theory and its propositions when it comes to dismissing an employee. And so first, before we get into why it's important to consider organizational justice, let's talk about three major components or propositions of organizational justice theory. And they are as follows. The first is that organizational justice can be conceptualized as being, in one part, distributive justice. And this refers to perceived fairness of an outcome or a decision itself. And so when it comes to dismissing an employee, often the person, most people aren't going to find this to be 
to have high levels of distributive justice unless they really felt like, oh, I knew this was coming. This is really inappropriate. Given the magnitude of how poorly I was performing, this is an appropriate decision by the organization to have me dismissed, for example. But often in the context of dismissal of employees from an organization, we'll focus on the latter two components of organizational justice theory, which are procedural justice, and in a second I'll talk about interactional justice, where procedural justice refers to the perceived fairness of the process used to determine an outcome or to arrive at a decision. So in this case, the decision would be the organization deciding to have the, or the, the employee in question leave the organization. So this is about that person who's being asked to leave their perception of the fairness of the process that was applied to make that decision. And then finally, there's interactional justice, which is the third component of organizational justice theory. And this component refers to a person's perception of fairness as it relates to interpersonal or informational interactions related to the termination of an outcome or the arrival at that dismissal decision itself. And so we'll talk about I'm going to showcase a couple studies here by Goldman that will hopefully bring to light why especially procedural justice is, is so important in the context of employee dismissals, but also to a lesser extent, interactional justice is also important as well, at least according to the research I'm going to show you in a second. And then we'll move on to talking about, well, how can we actually enhance procedural justice and interactional justice um, for those people who are going to be asked to leave the organization? So in terms of the importance of organizational justice for dismissals, here I'm going to review quickly a study by Goldman in 2001. And this is a study that was based on a sample of 439 employees who had been terminated. And they found that individuals were more likely to make verbal and written discrimination complaints to the EEOC if they perceived low distributive justice and low procedural justice. Now, of course, people will tend to, as we talked about, it's it's somewhat harder to um, lessen or in other words, to make or rather to think about the other side of the distributive justice continuum. It's, it's relatively difficult to maintain a person's perceptions of high distributive justice when they're being asked to leave the organization. However, procedural justice, on the other hand, is one component of organizational justice that can have a relatively big effect. And procedural justice, again, is that idea of process fairness. It's the degree to which a person perceives that the process used to decide whether or not they should leave the organization was fair. And there are some things we can do about that. In fact, Goldman's next study from 2003, which I'll highlight here, does a nice job of showing in terms of its results how important procedural justice is, especially higher levels of it, when it comes to employee dismissal decisions. So in this study by Goldman in 2003 that was based on a sample of 583 terminated employees, Goldman found what is called a three-way interaction between the three components of organizational justice, distributive, procedural, and interactional justice, in relation to the outcome that is legal claims. Okay? So in this case, the outcome is something that what is desirable from the organizational organization standpoint is fewer legal claims in terms of wrongful dismissal. So what the, the study found is that individuals were more likely or most likely to make a legal claim when they perceived a combination of low distributive justice, low procedural justice, and low interactional justice. So that hopefully is fairly intuitive. If people perceive low levels of justice across the board, they don't like the outcome or the decision itself, they don't like the process used to arrive at the decision, and they, they don't feel like they were treated with respect when it came to um, the, when the information was shared with them, and um, and, the, and the types of interactions that were um, that they had when it was told to them that they were going to be dismissed from the organization, it does seem fairly intuitive that the, having low levels of all those things will lead to higher legal claims. People more likely to make a claim of wrongful dismissal or perhaps a civil rights infringement as well. Now. What was really interesting about this study is that the, the author found that the negative effects of low distributive justice and low interactional justice were generally ameliorated ameliar or lessened, in other words, when procedural justice was high. And so I think it's really helpful to look at some plots of the findings here. And these are um, sometimes referred to as simple slopes interaction plots. And so I'll walk through them here very slowly to kind of show you what they found in a nutshell in their study. 
And so as you can see here, on the y-axis, we have distributive justice ranging from low to high. And, and, or on the x-axis, we have distributive justice ranging from low to high. And on the y-axis, we have legal claiming. And here you can see it ranges from 0 to 2 on this axis here, where 2 would be more legal claims, 0 less. Okay. All right, so the first thing that we'll focus on is the relationship between distributive justice and legal claiming, which you see here represented by this purple dotted line here, when there was low levels of interactional justice and low procedural justice. And so what you can see here is that legal claiming, it tends to be worse, or in other words, in this case, higher, when you have low levels of distributive justice and uh, when low interactional justice and low procedural justice are also in place. And then when you have higher levels of distributive justice, you can see that legal claiming tends to be a little bit lower there, even when there's low interactional justice and low procedural justice. Okay. Now, the next thing they found was still considering that there's low procedural justice, but now focusing on, well, what if there's high procedural inter or high interactional justice and low procedural justice? What does that relationship between distributive justice and legal claiming look like? And here you can see the effects really kind of between that relationship between distributive justice went from a negative relationship to almost a slightly positive relationship here when you add in or shift from low to high interactional justice, but still keep procedural justice low here. Okay, so this shows a little bit of the effect of why treating people with respect and dignity, which would be indicative of a high interactional justice, that this can have um, somewhat pronounced effects in terms of what happens when you have low distributive justice, people don't like the outcome or the decision you came to. Well, if you treat them well when delivering that information, treat them with respect and dignity, you do see a reduction in legal claiming here. Now, where the really exciting part of these findings comes into play is when we start considering what happens when we have high procedural justice. And so you'll see these represented by the green lines here. And so first we'll focus on this association, which you can already see we're, in terms of the y-axis, we're lower here, which is a good thing, meaning fewer legal claims. So when the relationship between distributive justice and legal claiming is flat, slightly negative here, when we have low interactional justice, but high procedural justice. So this really shows the importance of procedural justice here. When the process is explained, when the process is followed fairly and people perceive that, they're going to um, engage in less or lower levels of legal claiming here. And then finally, what happens when you have high levels of interactional justice and high levels of procedural justice? Well, here you can see that association between distributive justice and legal claiming is essentially flat here, and we see some of the lowest levels of low legal claiming. But really what you want to focus on here is one, looking at when you have low distributive justice, where do we see the, the, the lowest levels of legal claiming? Well, it's down here, as you can see, where we have, where the green lines represent conditions where we have high procedural justice. These are the situation, this really indicates the importance of procedural justice here, having that fair process in place. And you can see to a lesser extent, we also see this with high distributive justice levels as well. We still see that having uh, procedural justice in place, high levels of procedural justice is really important when from the perspective of legal claiming here. Okay, so how do we go about enhancing perceptions of procedural justice? So let's start with that first, because often in this situation, there's not a whole lot we can do with distributive justice. If you're telling someone they've been terminated or fired, that that outcome in and of itself is, is, is a tricky one. And that might just be individual differences in terms of people, the extent to which they perceive high versus low or somewhere in between of distributive justice with respect to that outcome or decision. But often we have a little bit more, we can have more influence when it comes to enhancing a person who's being dismissed, their perceptions of procedural justice. And in a moment after this, I'll talk about perceptions of interactional justice. So the first thing that we can focus on when it comes to enhancing perceptions of procedural justice is consistency. So what does this mean? Well, this means applying procedures consistently across people and over time. They're using the, the same, let's say, progressive disciplinary action plan and applying it to every single employee when it comes to ultimately perhaps deciding who's going to be dismissed from the organization. Second thing we should do when it comes to enhancing perceptions of procedural justice is 
bias suppression. And so this means to ensure that the person who applies the procedures or the people who apply the procedures um, do not stand to gain from the outcome or the decision and that those people have no prior prejudice, prejudice against the person in question who's being dismissed. The third thing we should do is adhere to information accuracy. And so what this means is to base the procedures on information that is credible and understood to be true. So making sure that there's good and accurate documentation, especially if it's related to an employee's low levels of performance that were consistent over time, making sure that that, is, that information is accurate, there's no errors in it, and at the very least, making sure that you pulled the information for the correct employee. The fourth one is correctability. If we want to enhance perceptions of procedural justice, we want to make sure there's, there's going to be some degree of correctability in the process itself. And so this means ensuring that procedures have built-in safeguards that allow the person in question who's receiving the dismissal notice to appeal that decision or outcome and to correct those any mistakes that might have been in the information or data that was used to make that decision. Now, the next one is representativeness. We want to make sure that the procedures are informed by the concerns of all stakeholders who might be affected by this decision, including the person who is being asked to leave the organization. But we also want to consider their coworkers, customers, managers, or anybody else who might be considered a stakeholder um, in this situation, or in other words, who might be affected by the decision of asking that person to leave. Finally, when it comes to enhancing perceptions of procedural justice, a really important one is ethicality. We want to ensure that procedures are consistent with prevailing moral and ethical standards, meaning we want to respect privacy, we want to avoid deception, things of that nature. So these are all things that we can do to enhance perceptions of procedural justice. What can we do to enhance perceptions of interactional justice? Which again has to do with informationally and interactionally how we're treating people treating with dignity, respect, and so forth. So what can we do to enhance those perceptions of interactional justice, knowing that both procedural and interactional justice can be really useful um, from the perspective of having a smoother transition of when it comes to asking someone to leave the organization who's been dismissed? Well, the first thing we can do to enhance perceptions of interactional justice is explanation. Providing an explanation is so important. And this means describing the process or procedure that was applied to arrive at a fair outcome and how and why that process and procedure was applied. The second thing we can do is engage in social sensitivity. And this means treating the person with dignity and respect throughout the, this process, this dismissal process, and even ahead of time. When it comes to progressive discipline, making sure that the person is treated with dignity and respect throughout that process. The third thing is consideration. And this means to listen thoughtfully to a person's concerns or to consider what they're saying, especially if it is something where they're challenging the evidence on which the decision was based, or they believe that there was bias or something in place. We wanna make sure that we listen thoughtfully to the person's concerns. The fourth and last thing we can do is we should show empathy and engage in empathy. And this means engaging in perspective taking, taking the perspective of the person that's being dismissed in order to understand that person's feelings and where they're coming from. This can go a long way in making sure a person feels he heard and understood through this process. This is often a very difficult process for people. It's a major life event if they're being dismissed from an organization due to low performance or some other behavioral issue. And you want to make sure that you listen to the person and really take the perspective of understand what it is they're going through. And this can be useful for enhancing perceptions of interactional justice. That they feel like they were interacted with well and with compassion and that they had their dignity and respect. So in this lecture, we focused on first, what is separation or retention? Then we focus more specifically on voluntary turnover and how we can identify it. What are some warning signs? How do we understand who's likely to voluntarily turn over? And then we shifted gears and focused on involuntary turnover and talked about how do we handle this very difficult process of involuntary turnover when the organization is asking an employee to leave, often against that employee's wishes to stay or remain in the organization. So here are the references that I based uh, or that I used throughout the slides here today. And this wraps up the lecture on employee separation and retention.